Naval warfare changed dramatically during the ferocious fighting days of World War II. Before the outbreak of war, the general military dogma still favored the colossal battleship, and you could certainly see why. If it was a case of simply ship versus ship out on the high seas, the bigger and badder your ship was, the better chance you stood. The more guns you had, the more chance you had of putting a hole in your enemy's ship before they did the same to you. It was all pretty basic. But as I said, things changed completely between 1939 and 1945, particularly with the events that took place in the Pacific Theater of War. The aircraft carrier, initially seen as occupying a supporting role, was now thrust center stage as Japan and the United States traded blows across a stretch of water measuring 8,600 kilometers between the two countries. The Essex-class aircraft carriers that began appearing during World War II would go on to be the 20th century's most numerous class of capital ships, with 24 built between 1941 and 1950. Not only did they play a fundamental role in the defeat of Japan, they were heavily involved in both the Korean and Vietnam Wars as well. But perhaps most importantly, their appearance also coincided with a major shift in naval doctrine, which led to the rise of the aircraft carrier and the carrier strike force. The end of the First World War had brought a firm conviction that carnage on such a scale must never be allowed to happen again. Spoiler alert, it did add worse. It's the First World War. <laughs> Part of this was the Washington Naval Treaty signed in 1922 by the United States, United Kingdom, France, Italy, Japan, which effectively placed size limitations on future battleships, battle cruisers, and aircraft carriers. Noble intentions, no doubt, but by the mid-1930s, both Japan and Italy had pulled out, and soon enough, every former signatory was making massive ships. <laughs> As I mentioned a moment ago, aircraft carriers certainly didn't hold the same prestige before World War II as they did by the end of it. The first ship designed to accommodate seaplanes was the HMS Ark Rahl, launched in 1914, though to call it a bona fide aircraft carrier would be a bit of a stretch. The first purpose-built carriers were the British HMS Hermes and the Japanese Hosho. Hermes was started first in 1918, while the Hosho was the first to be commissioned in 1922, so I'll leave it up to you as to who was really first. As the world crept towards the second major conflict of the 20th century, aircraft carriers typically accommodated three Three types of aircraft, torpedo bombers, dive bombers, and fighters, usually used for fleet defense and bomber escort duties. These were normally all fairly small, single-engined aircraft with folding wings to allow for easier storage. It's worth highlighting, again, that at this point, aircraft carriers were seen as supporting actors, with the battleship still reigning supreme in the eyes of naval commanders around the world. While the most famous surprise aerial attack to come from aircraft carriers during World War II came on the 7th of December 1941, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, it had been roughly modeled on an attack on the Italian fleet at Taranto by the British on the 11th and 12th of December 1940. 21 fairy swordfish torpedo bombers flew from HMS Illustrious and disabled three of the six Italian battleships while in port, with a loss of just two aircraft. This was the first time aircraft carriers, and their aircraft of course, proved themselves as more than a match for the Titanic battle ships that were still very much in vogue. Just under a year later, planes with the Japanese rising sun beneath their wings began striking out across Hawaii. The attack on Pearl Harbor lasted just one hour and 15 minutes, but sank four battleships and badly damaged four more, while another 11 ships were either sunk or damaged. But quite miraculously, not a single one of three Pacific Fleet aircraft carriers were in Pearl Harbor at the time. The attack on the Hawaiian Islands had been brutally effective, but once the dust settled, most agreed that things could have been a lot worse. The Japanese had left the Americans reeling, but it wouldn't be long until Uncle Sam climbed to his feet and hit back. Some argue that the events of the 7th of December 1941 forced the US to rethink its naval strategy. But in truth, the uh, potential behind aircraft carriers had been growing for some time. The British attack on Taranto and the Japanese on Pearl Harbor merely confirmed lingering suspicions. Aircraft launched from a carrier could hit targets at over 200 miles, while battleships were constrained to 20 miles or less. While one of these monstrous vessels could still wreak havoc on other ships and also land targets, they could be horribly exposed when swarms of aircraft descended on them. 
The first Essex class carrier, the USS Essex, or CV9 as it was first known, was laid down over six months before Pearl Harbor on the 24th of April 1941. She was to be 18.2 meters, 60 feet longer, nearly 3 meters, 10 feet wider, and more than a third heavier than the Yorktown class aircraft carriers that came before it. She was part of a triple order with CV10, later USS Yorktown, and CV11, eventually USS Intrepid, both being laid down on the 1st of December 1941. Another eight were ordered on the 9th of September 1941, and an additional two, two days after the attack on Pearl Harbor. All of a sudden, the US had 13 Essex-class carriers in some stage of production, and if that wasn't enough, after the war was formally declared, Congress had aside funds to build another 19, although the fleet would actually top out at 24, with several cancelled after the end of the war. The attack on Pearl Harbor saw the production of the USS Essex significantly sped up, and the carrier was commissioned on the 31st of December 1942. From then until the end of the Second World War, a new Essex-class carrier seemed to roll off the production line every few months, as the juggernaut that was the US manufacturing sector hit top gear. The Essex carriers were the largest carriers the US had ever built when they entered service, measuring 265 meters in length with a beam of 45 meters and a draft of 8.4 meters. They displaced around 37,000 tons, although with later modifications, that went up to just over 47,000 tons. They came with four Westinghouse geared steam turbines, and eight Babcock and Wilcox boilers, giving them a top speed of 32.5 knots and a whopping range of 37,000 kilometers, about 23,000 miles. However, if they wanted to get that sort of distance that need to travel at roughly half their top speed. The crew included 268 officers and 2,363 enlisted men, with each carrier accommodating between 90 and 100 aircraft. These were normally a mixture of fighters, torpedo bombers, and dive bombers. Many of these could be stationed on deck, with the remaining kept below in hangars, accessible via a side elevator on the port side of the ship. This elevator, measuring 18 by 10 meters, traveled vertically up to the flight deck, and its position on the side of the ship was chosen so that a large hole wouldn't be left on the deck if the elevator were to malfunction. Now, as we'll get to shortly, aircraft carriers became the holy grail for attack aircraft as World War II progressed. With this in mind, the Essex carriers came with a formidable defense system. This included 12 100 127 mm guns, four twin turrets on the starboard side near the islands, the command tower, four on the port side forward, and four on the port side aft. Then we have the 17 quadruple Bofors 40 mm anti aircraft guns, and on average 65 Erlikon 20 mm AA guns. Total all of these up, and there were at least 94 separate guns to protect these ships. Radar was also hugely important since the Essex class carriers came with the latest technology and all had SK Air Search and SC and SG surface search radars on board. They also had two Mark 37 fire control directors, early gun control fire systems, and the planned position indicator, a radar display which allowed the carrier to keep track of ships within its strike force at night or in bad weather, a piece of technology that allowed the ships to remain at top speed without fear of collision. The Essex-class carriers were heavily involved in naval operations around the Pacific as the United States gradually inched its way across the ocean towards Japan. Their roles were varied and included attacking the Japanese fleet, supporting landings, fleet protection, bombing the Japanese home islands, and transporting aircraft and troops. Essex carriers took part in the invasion of Tarawa in the Gilbert Islands, which began on the 20th of November 1943, and the amphibious assault on the Marshall Islands again in that same month. The USS Intrepid was also present when its task force began pounding the Chark Islands on the 17th February 1944 under what was aptly named Operation Hailstorm. U.S. forces pretty much obliterated the Japanese presence on the island, but the USS Intrepid suffered a torpedo hit, jamming the ship's rudder to port and flooding several compartments. The crew managed to rig a temporary rudder out of scrap canvas and hatch covers, and the carrier limped back to Pearl Harbor. After repairs, she was back in action supporting the invasion of the Philippines, and during the battle off Cape Ngano, aircraft from USS Intrepid and other carriers sank four Japanese carriers as the collapse of the their Imperial Navy gathered speed. With the Americans nearing Japan, the Japanese fell back on their most desperate tactic. On the 25th of November 1944, a kamikaze attack smashed into the USS Essex, killing 15 and wounding 44, while the USS Intrepid was hit by three separate kamikaze attacks, resulting in 66 deaths on board. But if there was an event that typified the rise of the aircraft carrier, it came on the 7th of April 1945. Now, if you don't know about the Japanese Yamato-class battleships, then you could watch our video on them after this one. The two battleships that comprised the class, the Yamato and the Masashi, remains the largest battleships ever put to sea. 
By the first week of April in 1945, the Musashi had already been sunk, and Yamato was on its way to take part in a suicidal last stand to defend Japan. Operation Tango was the last major Japanese naval operation, and it called for the remnants of the shattered Japanese Navy to essentially beach themselves on Okinawa and fight to the death. Unfortunately for them, U.S. naval superiority was such that they never even made it. Once U.S. submarines reported the direction of the Yamato and the nine other ships it was traveling with, the full might of the U.S. Navy came crashing down on them. To even call it a battle would be a little unfair. With no air support, the Japanese ships were attacked mercilessly by aircraft from eight different carriers, five of which were Essex class. They swarmed around the slow Yamato, and just over two hours after the attack had begun, the grand battleship that had once been the pride of the Japanese Navy began to capsize. If you needed a more telling example of just how destructive and vital aircraft carriers, and in particular the Essex carriers, had become, it was the events of the 7th of April 1945. The Yamato slipped below the waves, and it took with it the final remnants of the battleship's shattered, indestructible image. There was now a new king of the seas. Quite astonishingly, though the US lost 12 aircraft carriers during World War II, not a single Essex class was sunk. They went on to take part in operations during the Korean War and later the Vietnam War, though by that stage the advancement in aircraft technology made them unsuitable for most modern planes, and they were primarily used as helicopter carriers or anti-submarine platforms. That being said, it was aircraft launched from the USS Ticonderoga that attacked North Vietnamese aircraft after the Gulf of Tonkin incident, which effectively sparked the Vietnam War. During the Cold War, several Essex-class carriers were used in operations when the US needed to flex its muscles, most notably the blockade of Cuba during the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis and also to support the Bay of Pigs invasion of the island the previous year. They also came to be involved in the US space program as recovery ships between 1960 and 1973, and one Essex-class carrier or another was always on hand to retrieve astronauts once their re-entry module had landed in the ocean. USS Hornet was tasked with bringing Neil Armstrong and Goethe back home after their historic trip to the moon in 1969, and the steps taken by the three astronauts, the first back on Earth, were painted on the deck of the carrier in commemoration. As excellent as the US carriers had performed during World War II and the subsequent years, they were soon supplanted by the new breed of supercarriers, and gradually they were decommissioned, mostly during the 1960s and 70s. The last operating Essex carrier was the USS Lexington, which was decommissioned in 1991 and became a museum shortly after. Three other Essex carriers today serve as museums, the USS Intrepid, the USS Yorktown, and the USS Hornet, while the rest were scrapped, except for the USS Oriskany, which was scuttled off the coast of Florida and acts as a scuba dive. Side. The Essex class carriers weren't the biggest carriers during the war, but thanks in no small part to their high numbers, they played a huge role in the shift that saw the aircraft carrier surge to the front of the pecking order when it came to naval war vessels. Quite simply, what came before them and what came after them was entirely different. You could probably argue that change was coming anyway, but if that's the case, then these 24 ships were present at exactly the right period of time in history and must be seen as true trailblazers. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. Please do hit that thumbs up button below if you did. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching.